Hello, I'm Michael Enright, and this is the Rewind Podcast. Today on the podcast, another gem from the CBC Radio Archives, first heard on Rewind, the radio program. We hope you enjoy it. It was a book interview like no other. Donna Williams was a 29-year-old woman who had written her autobiography called Nobody Nowhere. As a child, people had thought her retarded or deaf. It turned out she was autistic. Peter Zosky invited her to be interviewed on Morningside about the book and about her life. The resulting conversation, which first aired in 1992, is an astonishing insight into the world of one autistic woman and into the power of the human spirit. Donna Williams started by reading a poem she had written. In a room without windows, in the company of shadows, you know they won't forget you, they'll take you in. Emotionally shattered, don't ask if it mattered, don't let that upset you, just start again. In a world under glass, you can watch the world pass, nobody can touch you, you think you're safe. But the wind can blow cold in the depths of your soul, where you think nothing can hurt you, till it's too late. Run till you drop, do you know how to stop? All the people walk right past you, you wave goodbye. And they all merely smiled, for you looked like a child. You never thought that they'd upset you, they saw you cry. So take advice and don't question the experts. Don't think twice, you just might listen. Run and hide to the corners of your mind, alone, like a nobody nowhere. I remember my first dream, or at least the first that I can recall. I was moving through white, with no objects, just white and bright spots of fluffy colour surrounded me everywhere. I passed through them and they passed through me. It was the sort of thing that made me laugh. This dream came before any others with shit or monsters or people in them, and certainly before I noticed the difference between the three. I must have been less than three years old, and the dream depicted the nature of my world at that time. Awake, I pursued the dream relentlessly. I'd face the light shining through the window next to my cot and rub my eyes furiously. There they were, the bright fluffy colours moving through the white. Stop that, came the intrusive garble, and I'd continue merrily. Slap. I discovered the, the air was full of spots. If you looked into the nothingness, there were spots. People could walk by, obstructing the magical view of nothingness. I'd move past them. They'd garble. Gabble. <laughs> My attention would be firmly set on my desire to lose myself in the spots. I'd ignore the gabble and look straight through this obstruction with calm expression, soothed by being lost in the spots. Slap. I was learning about the world. I learned eventually to lose myself in anything I desired. The patterns on the wallpaper or the carpet, the sound of something over and over again, like the hollow thud I'd get from tapping my chin. Even people became no problem. Their words became a mumbling jumble, and their voices a pattern of sounds. I could look through them until I wasn't there, and then later I'd learn to lose myself in them. Words were no problem, but other people's expectations for me to respond to them were. This would have required my understanding what was said, but I was too happy losing myself to want to be dragged back by something as two-dimensional as understanding. That's Donna Williams, as I say, reading. And it may be worth remembering, as you come to know her better, our conversation fills most of Morningside's first hour today, the apparent ease and comfort comfort with which she can bring her own words and visions off the printed page. At one point in a meeting Donna and I had before the exchange we're playing this morning, in fact, and if I may for a moment leap ahead of the story here, I grew frustrated with my own inability to speak to her so she could understand me, to talk so she could sort out my thoughts from the mumbling jumble that speech often represents to her, and, excusing myself, went down the hall to my typewriter and banged out what was in fact a letter to her. When I returned, she perused it for a while and then, somewhat to my embarrassment, read it aloud, with, obviously, total comprehension. As you'll hear her say later this morning, she is the opposite of illiterate. For her, the written word, sometimes even her own, is the key to freedom. It's speech, and sometimes sight and hearing, too, that is the prison. The dictionary definitions of autism, which tend to talk of self-absorption, even morbid absorption in the case of the concise Oxford, are not helpful. Autism is a rare condition, but a troubling one. 
It affects about four children out of every 10,000, usually, though not always obviously, boys. As Donna was, many autistic children are thought to be deaf through their apparent failure to pay attention to the spoken word, or worse, disturbed. They can gaze into space, ignoring what is said to them, or repeat endlessly the same monotonous patterns of movement, sometimes at some risk to themselves. No one really knows what causes autism, though Donna's breakthrough book gives some clues, nearly all of which seem to point to a physical or a chemical imbalance. The interview you're about to hear, actually two interviews, for they take different forms, took place under unusual conditions. A couple of days before we recorded it, as I've indicated, Donna came into this studio. She needed simply a chance to get accustomed to me, to hear my voice. Unfamiliarity is much more than an inconvenience to her, it's a threat. She needed to know what I would ask her, and together, this is what you'll hear in the first part, we worked out a set of simple questions. Then she went away and painstakingly wrote out her answers, which she would put, as she said, into the holes between my questions. She needed the lights dimmed, too. Bright colors, even the bright fluffy colors you heard about in her poem, can shatter her. It's as if much of what we see or absorb in our reality is in her different reality, exaggerated and distorted. She sat at the piano bench because I'd noticed that when we first met, she seemed to feel more comfortable talking in motion, and we had offered her, not put on, for the touch of other people is anathema to her. Touch, as she says, can be pain. We had offered her a microphone that she could affix to her lapel. Across the room, we talked to each other. And then, to my surprise, and although she held her written responses in her hand and sometimes referred to them as we went along, she often, as you'll hear, left her written text where it, text where it was and searched in her own brilliant and troubled mind for her answers. Donna, what does the word sad mean to you? Um... I think one thing I would like to say about sad is that before all emotions were so high that I couldn't tell the difference between one or the other and I also couldn't tell if the uh, what whether the emotions were just some kind of body thing or whether they were feelings so it for me just all felt like tidal waves and that made me feel very very scared so I thought I was dying or something really awful had happened but I didn't know what it was because there was no interpretation of any of the emotions. Um, I think that that it was very difficult for me to tell happy from sad from scared because all of them were so high-pitched. They all just went straight to feeling like scared. So um, I think though now that I value having sad just like I value any other feeling because to know what it is, to name it and know it belongs to me and that that it is it's part of me. It makes for me the difference between just to function and to experience. It's for me emotions are the difference between to appear and to be and I would prefer to be. What does the word lonely mean to you? Lonely. Um, One thing about lonely is it's very hard to recognize lonely when the first response to lonely is to disappear in something else. Once you have disappeared into something else, you are oblivious to everything and yourself. So where is lonely? Lonely is gone. When you become a spot on the wall... When you can't find you, you're so absorbed in that. There's no lonely. The processing of lonely doesn't happen um, that easily. I think it's also very hard to um, be lonely when I feel part of things, like the spot on the wall, like a bright coloured light. It translates so quickly from lonely into being caught up in the sensory experience of something Um, and it's such a place of no interpretation that lonely often doesn't happen alone happens when I am away from my emotions or I am away from um, 
being able to get lost in different things, then I feel alone, but I'm not sure I'm lonely. What does the word love mean to you? Love. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think I would like to say what I think love is not. Um, I don't. I think love is not about people wanting you to do things just because they're ego needy. And I think that love is not about assuming that your definitions are the same as some other person's. And love is not about wanting a person to perform as though they love when they don't even know what they feel and they don't know what love is, so they don't miss it in its absence. And love is also not about touching someone. When I think of what love is, I think that I know what it is to love too. I love to be with street lights, pink street lights. I love to be with chandeliers. But I don't experience these this love too um, as love, the kind of package deal thing of respect and care and um, understand. I shift from each one of those ingredients to the other. I don't experience as the pack package deal I'm very mono, I single into one piece of it or another piece so I can have each of the pieces but um, to then take it on as a package and say I love that that person or something it's very hard for me to keep the bits together and walk around with that sort of emotional picture inside if there's more than two messages running I can't decipher which one's which, so I wouldn't know what I felt or I'd throw it all out because it was just a jumble. I um, also think that when I'm close to someone, it doesn't involve egos for me, and that is different to someone else, I think. For me, the point of closeness is to experience myself in company. I think that other people, they... They like to take on the other people like some kind of baggage. I don't need the other people's baggage and I don't need to get to know them. I just sense them and I grasp their system and that's that. I don't need to know what they had for breakfast, what their interest is or anything. Um, the person is either like me or they're not like me. I recognise the patterns and if I recognise that they're using a system I can comprehend that, for me, is the important thing. You are listening on tape to Donna Williams, the 29-year-old author of Nobody Nowhere, a recently published autobiographical book that's given the non-autistic world the best picture it's ever had of the world of the autistic. As well as her autism, for no one seems to think there is a link, Donna was an abused child. You may remember the slap in the brief excerpt from her book she read for us this morning. As a result, probably, of that abuse, she sometimes retreated into other personalities, at least two of whom, as you'll, as you'll hear, had names. Who was is, who is Carol? Carol, originally, was someone I met in a park, but then I didn't understand, for me, that the mirror reflection was another person. I, like some cats, also think it's... Um, sorry, I didn't understand it was me, my reflection. I thought it was another person. So then, because she was the first person I really experienced as a separate whole person, I then said, that's Carol. And then I decided that I would become this picture I'd put out there of who she was and that I would become everything the people would like, pretty much to keep them at a distance from me and also some for survival. But by keeping them at a distance, they couldn't know me. I could feel safe. I could feel always hiding. But Carol was like a repertoire of acting normal rules. Her language was a repertoire of situation comedies, commercials, which just got more refined and mirroring of other people's conversations and funny bits which just got more refined later um, in talking just Carol would seize upon bits and pieces of what they'd say 
and they would trigger other stored bits and just come out with some verbal garble. If it made them laugh, that was all that mattered. If it kept them away from affecting me personally in any way, that was all that mattered. If it kept me away from being aware of my own emotions and my own body, that for me was all that mattered. Um, it was like using yourself as a puppet. And Willie, who was Willie? Willie was hmm. uh, started when there was a, a power, a, a night light that goes into a PowerPoint, uh, was iridescent green, and it was under the bed, but I thought this was, I was about two, three, and I thought this was eyes before I understood the idea of eyes, just these green lights were eyes. And I was so afraid of this inside myself, I built up a picture that this was a bodiless person with green eyes. You couldn't see the body. And so then I, I feared this, but I also feared my environment. I, it was always bombarding me, always intruding, always challenging, always confronting. So I identified with my own character and took this on as another kind of version of myself. But over the years, this became my intellectual self. I could say, it's okay to believe in something. It's okay to think because it's not me who's thinking. It's like, it's like Donna the case versus Donna the person who feels for everything that she's doing. Willie was like my completely objective, controllable version of myself out there, but also the storage place for all the knowledge, um, but mostly a defence, like a wall, a way that if people touched me, they didn't touch me. If they spoke to me, they were not speaking to me. So I could survive the bombardment of the environment. And yet, Willie and Carol went away, and Donna came out. Why? I think one of the main, several things that led to this. One was that I, I met, finally met some people who were like me. I didn't know why they were like me, but all of a sudden, the whole point of these as what I call war strategies, using the characters as a war strategy, to keep the world out from my world. Um, the whole point of that was like attacked because I'd, so, I'd met um, some other people who were like me. First one when I was about 22 and then another one when uh, I was 25. And that affected me emotionally <coughs> and I thought, my God, how can anybody get in here? How can anyone break through? These are, the, my system is perfect, isn't it? <laughs> um, my war strategies are complete, aren't they? And um, that was the first strike. I think the second strike was that that made me think there was something out there that was worth reaching out to. Even if my emotions were so intense, I couldn't stand the impact. Um, I seemed then much more trapped in here. I also with um, allergies and vitamin troubles and sugar, blood sugar problems, when that was addressed, my stress level came very much down, very dramatically. And that was part of the fuel to keep my anxiety so high that I could maintain these war strategies, this constant image, 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 throw something at them, get them away, make them laugh, keep them moving so they don't affect me, so they don't know who I am, um, so they don't see anything spontaneously coming from me. So that began to crumble. But also it had to happen from a personal side now because as Carol and Willie, I had sacrificed all sense of body awareness. I had sacrificed all identification with my own emotions. I had sacrificed all ownership of 
my own knowledge. I consider myself a walking dictionary, like a, a, a book, like a resource place walking around. Um, that's not a whole life. It's very hard for me to hold me all together. I think it always would have been because I'm so mono. All the different systems are really hard to integrate and I just blow fuses um, and there's a constant state of system shutdown in one thing or the other so it's hard but for this for the times that I get to hold on to a whole self it's worth it it means the difference between functioning and experiencing it's a it's it's not just living as a puppet it's being a person and everyone else has a right to that and I have a right to that and I have to give myself that right to that what will autistic people get out of reading Nobody Nowhere? Um, one thing, the most important thing, is to know they're not alone. To know that everyone in the world is not just people who um, go by a different system. Um, to know there's other people out there like them who, who will be able to relate to them in their own way. Um, I think also to have faith in their own abilities and that there's a lot of abilities in that word disability. I um, hear from a lot of autistic people and I know of some even very young autistic children, um, 10, 11, 13 years old, who have read my book or want to read my book or who one who reads it, um, who has read it, a couple of times and keeps it with her as like um, a way to confirm for herself that that she is understood, that she's not alone. That's very, that's a very, for me, direct effect, um, an important one. I think also that um, it is good for other people to see that there are other ways to... Um, help autistic people. I don't think there's you know, any snap your fingers cure, but um, sometimes it is like um, that it will give some people some shortcuts so that the autistic people don't have to suffer for other people's trial and error so much. Understand? Yeah. But also I'm only one person just because the things have worked for me doesn't mean they're going to work for everybody else. Some people say autism is a disability. I want you to talk about abilities within the disabilities of autism. <laughs> Come and see me buzz on a pink street light. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, um, I think my appreciation of colour and sound, pattern, order smell and the texture of things stems from difficulties in the integration of my senses but it also means that these things can affect me far more emotionally and physically than I see them affecting some other people and um, I feel that I interact with these things and I'm social with these things I know myself in relation to these things and I'm swept up and I'm captured by these things I am sometimes just tickled by the experience of a colour, physically tickled by the experience of a colour, which is so intense I can hardly stand it. Or another colour or sound will make me very relaxed and peaceful. I see, because of this, such beauty in, the, in nature and the things like the music of the ocean or the rhythm of walking through leaves or over gravel or the rise and fall in pitch when you walk over different surfaces or all the different colours that you see in clouds and the sky, which other people take in as a whole and just see as grey on a blue background. I see the grass, like all the different colours of the blades of grass. It's like a mosaic. Other people just see green. They, I think because they um, don't see all these things, other things, that they go on finding perhaps excitement in very constructed things, maybe things that rob from each other. 
I don't. So I don't know what I'm missing there. Um, I question whether I am missing there. Um, I think also my situation means that I, I know how to allow people to have the space to own themselves. I don't have any ego need to have a part of them or to leech on them or to become entangled in them. I also don't judge their relative value outside of my direct experience of them. Sometimes also I feel that I'm very, very free. I feel like I'm part of the wind or part of the rain, very intimately at home with nature. Uh, I don't see this as disability, but among people I have trouble with the mechanics and sometimes I have very big trouble with the mechanics. Um, but my troubles don't have to rob me of the people world. Other people just don't know how to communicate with or be with me in any other way which would make more sense to me. And some of them too arrogantly assume that their reality is the only reality, the only healthy one, the only so-called normal one. And I think they miss out on a lot because of that. That's what I want to say. Thank you. That's Donna Williams, if you're just joining us, and she's talking about some of the as some of the aspects of her remarkable new book, Nobody Nowhere, which is published by Doubleday. I'm Peter Zosky. You're listening to Morningside on CBC Radio. The first section of which this morning, as I've been indicating, has taken an, an, an unusual form. The part you've just heard of my conversation with Donna Williams, which took place last Friday, was, if not rehearsed, at least prepared for. Written questions on my part carefully worked out answers on hers. But when we'd first met, Donna and I had seemed to get along as I groped for ways to make myself clear to her through the prism of her understanding. I'd asked then, after we'd agreed on the written technique that you just heard, if when we finished we could just talk some more off the cuff, if we could at least have a chance to hear the kind of extemporaneous remark. I don't know if you heard that as she was saying, she said, come see me buzz on a pink street light. That wasn't in her prepared answer. Donna was uncertain about that. Translating my reality into hers is work for her, and she was hesitant about letting her difficulties show. I am not my problems, she said once, and more than once she said she didn't want to be part of a, pre a freak show, Donna the case as opposed to Donna the person. But I'd been moved by her, and I wanted other people to have a chance to meet her as I had met her earlier. So last Friday, with her permission, when the formal part of our interview was over, we kept the tape rolling. Can we talk some more? I don't know. I don't either. I was... What does he want to say? What does Peter want to say? What do you want to say, Peter? Ah, that's the first time you called me Peter. <laughs> I'm curious. I'm... I will... No, I'm not here. <coughs> How do I see you? We will talk for 15 minutes, like I said. Yes. You know, that was, I'm very moved. I'm, uh, you, you, you touched me when you talked about... And this... <clears throat> I'm almost jealous of you. Mm. Do you understand? No, but you can say it. It's your words. Well, you see things I don't see. Does jealous not mean that you want to then take those things from me? No, no. Jealous means I wish... Is that like, is that like I wish that I could understand people better as they speak? It means, yeah, but it means I wish I could see, sometimes wish I could see what you can see, but not to take it from you. Yes. Understand? I try, but it's yeah. very rough. Yeah. Maybe that's why I think that the whole point is for you to say it for you, so that you can clarify <coughs> what you think and feel. Because if I can't make good sense of the significance of what you've said, then is that not the point for you to speak, is to further know what you believe and feel? Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, you, yes, I understand. You were reading your answers, but you weren't reading your answers. Yes. So it's as if the, 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 the words on the paper were just a map that you wanted to go back to from time to time. Yes. Because it was all... Was we were you were we were talking? Yes. And you were you didn't we didn't think we might might be able to. You had you had doubts when yes. we met before. I, um, I moved away from my writing. Yeah. Because I wanted to see that I can, and also I have used my writing as a bridge to more speaking without my writing. But still, I know I need it as a map. Sometimes I do too. Mm. Sometimes I need to write so I know what I want to say. Yes. Remember when we first met and I wrote you a letter? Yes. And then you read it aloud? Yes. Do you understand better if you read aloud? Does it sink in? Sometimes. Depends on which track's working. Sometimes meaning has fallen out of what I hear, but is switched on through my eyes. Sometimes my eyes are not making any meaning, just seeing shape, colour, pattern, even of a written word. Oh yes, here's a line, here's a curve, that one goes to there and it's approximately this long and then there's a space in between. Nothing, no interpretation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes to, to say, OK, Cut our losses here. I think that's the right saying. Is that right saying? And turn on two systems at once. One is bound to work. But can you turn on a system at will? No. 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 You can shift to another system. Like for me, um, if I have been very bombarded by lots of things, sometimes I have a trouble I call overload. And what happens is all I know next thing, I'm just buzzing at everything because I don't know what I'm seeing. I'm just seeing the pattern and the colour and the texture and the smell and the where it is and how it matches with something else. But there's no interpretation happening. So all those language things, all those safety things, all those communication things that are meant to happen through my eyes have fallen out. Like, um, some, like having a bucket and someone just keeps putting holes in the bucket until the bucket is hardly even there. And um, the same is like with um, hearing. And if the two go at the same time, I'm in big trouble. Then I feel so... I feel like... It's just like stepping into... from having some meaning or a percentage of meaning to having none at all. Um, and it's like falling asleep, but you're awake. And it's very frightening. Nothing's familiar, because you can't link it. You can't interpret it. You can only just experience the things broken down to all their little component parts. And then I might switch to smell, or the feel of something. Ha! Ah, and back comes familiarity. I say, I'm still here. Um, it's very good. I can switch to another system, but I can't switch a system back on. If, for me, through my eyes, the system's fallen out, I might touch the thing and try to remember what the word is for it. I might get the word. I know that the word has something to do with the thing, but I can't put the two together. Um, and when it comes back, if it's a wall or something, I've never loved a wall so much as when the two go click and I say, hey, that's a wall. I know what it's for. I know what it's made from. I know what it's connected to. And it's like, it's more than waking up. It's, yeah, it's not like being asleep. It's like being dead. And it's more than waking up. It's like coming to life. And you just love the first thing. That's it. Could be the floor. Could be the sound of your friend's voice that you realize isn't just a pattern. You put it together with the person and say, Hi, I know you. It's good. 
How much better is it now that your diet is better? What a Comprehension. Oh, wow. Um, I want to say about this. About diet? About the comprehension, okay. especially. Um, <clears throat> when I was younger, till I was about nine, I could speak, but it was all stored things. And um, I, when I got to read in the dictionary, I got more and more meanings in here, so I tried to interpret that way. Um, and I was still, they thought, she can't hear us at that time. After this, I realized that if I spoke as they spoke and tried to imagine what I meant as I used their words, then I could get meaning. So I shadow spoke, yes, like speaking spontaneously. As the person speaks, you speak as them. Only not, eventually not even a second delay as them and then you shut your mouth and you can just speak in here as they speak like you speak say anything yes i will say, say anything, anything yes. yes and if, and if I, I keep, keep talking, talking you, can you can shadow, shadow speak, speak with me, with me. Yeah. there is no delay in that it's at like all. that and That's i astonishing. try to think what do i mean what do i mean as i'm speaking, speaking as you, you. I'm trying to do it to you, you see, and it doesn't work. <laughs> but what I did then was this became my whole comprehension of language was so hard because I never got any time to think, well, what do I think of what I've now worked out what they've said as me being them? <laughs> and there was no space because they then sit there with this face wanting a response and there's been nothing happening. I've been interpreting. And so I just will look and say, mm, that's a nice wall whatever first thing I can do that's very makes you very trapped makes you think what's the whole point of this talk talk once I was 22 was the first time I understood that people did not do this this was 99% of my comprehension after fixing up my allergies sugar problems vitamin problems I um, started to hear people more directly and I was hearing with comprehension, just a percentage, but far more directly. They could speak with their own voice. I didn't have to bother speaking with their voice and trying to work out what I mean speaking as them. And it was at first maybe 15%. It's improved. Now in good circumstances, familiar place, familiar people, used to the voice, so I can tune out all the intonation, tune out all the rest of the visuals tune into the meaning of the words can hear directly sometimes 70 percent uh, when it first was this was uh, uh, mostly after the book i felt so affected i thought wow it's like stop i'm not deaf anymore <laughs> i felt like i was meaning deaf i was meaning deaf and i was meaning blind especially meaning deaf and then i felt the whole world has opened up i thought hey it's not me being here with you as you and me also being here as me. This actual thing is company. There's other people. <laughs> mm. It's really strange, um, but very good. Uh, Do you remember telling me that <clears throat> about you're the opposite of illiterate? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was... The, the book gave you the freedom. I mean, the freedom's already... There. Tell me that again. Can you? Would you, please? I, I remember what you said of yesterday about... Um, I read about some things that you have to do with illiteracy, mm -hmm. and I said I felt I was in some ways the opposite to yeah. illiterate. Like, um, like with... Um, there's two ways I can explain that, two very different things. One was that I read my first 10 years very, very fluently without any meaning. And they said, Donna, you've got no intonation in it. And so I just put it in anywhere that I thought it would go. <laughs> and then they realized slowly there was no comprehension. That, to me, is like illiteracy. Um, and, but there's another whole thing, which is now I still have trouble reading with meaning. It falls out 
in parts, percentages. I get some bits, I string the rest together, make the rest up, whatever. <laughs> but um, with hearing, it's like the hearing version of illiteracy, very much. But to assume that then the person's not intelligent inside, to assume that then there's no mechanics happening in there of, of, um, of them bringing something from themselves outwards is very ignorant. You can't assume just because you don't see you're making an effect that those mechanics are not being worked through slowly. Things got in, but they weren't processed. They got processed slowly over time. By then, it was out of the context that they started in. So all the linking of those things that got worked through, um, it got linked but now back here in the back of your mind no direct access this is for me important because music and art and um, indirect forms of communication were ways of tapping all that knowledge that had been worked through and processed but back here out of context not in the front of my mind so with writing that it could come out automatically without any thinking without even knowing what I was writing till I saw it. This was very important for me to access all this knowledge in here I was unaware I had. And the reason I was unaware I had it is because as the things come in, it's like a blocked sink. By the time it clears, it's the next day or it's another room or there's other people talking now. And there's no way to access it until you get a tap. You turn the tap on, out it comes. That tap can be art, that tap can be dance, that tap can be music, that tap can be writing. All the things that are indirect, that allow this free-flowing. Just because one path's blocked doesn't mean they're all blocked. Turn on another system. Who, who first read the book? Who, um, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who second read the book? <laughs> <laughs> um, the second person was uh, I took it to a child psychiatrist who worked at the hospital where I worked as a temp and I didn't know him but I took it in and I said here's, here's a book I've written and I told him I wanted him to tell me what kind of mad I was because I didn't know how I didn't know what was going on in there. I knew I wasn't stupid. I, I didn't think I was mad, but I kept being told I was mad. So what else could I have called it? I knew I'd been called autistic, but I didn't know what it meant. I just thought it was an adjective that meant withdrawn. And that's all. I probably got from a dictionary, adjective means withdrawn or something. I don't know. But that's all I knew. So I never thought this word could account for what was happening would have what, been helpful if someone explained it. Was it was the manuscript did you type the manuscript or Yes. Was it as long then? I mean was it a complete book? It is as long as it is now. It took was non almost non stop for about four weeks, I know, very short time. <laughs> but, four weeks? But there was no thinking. There was no thinking. It was just this. It's just this. Other people take longer because they have to think and know what they're writing. I didn't know till I saw it. That's what happened. Let me say to the radio that when Donna says this, she's, she's moving her fingers like a, like a keyboard. Now, did the child psychiatrist know how good it was? Yes. What did he say? He got very excited, and I, he said, what was I going to do with it? Mm -hmm. I told him I was going to tear it up into little pieces and burn it. And he was very upset and excited and said that it was an important book and that could I please let him send it to an expert in autism. And so because I still wanted to find out why I was like I was, I agreed. And then that woman, she had some books published and so then she asked if she could send it to her publisher and she talked to me of why it was important and so I said 
yes, that she could. I have the feeling you still don't know how important it is. I, I have the feeling I still don't don't that you still don't know. Getting there slowly. When I first went to talk of the book and publicity and things, I had really no idea, and I just thought, oh, well, they all seem to know. So um, I had a very <laughs> sketchy idea, very sketchy, but I know that there's many things I believe strongly in. I know that the things that have happened to me have happened to others. I know that there's a lot of misunderstandings out there that are hurting both the parents and the autistic people and that by me letting other people read the book they can start talking, they can think of other ideas, they can form other programs, um, they can help bring other avenues to autistic people to tap what is in there but not accessible. Um, they can acknowledge that there's a lot of abilities in this person they consider disabled. Many things like this that I understand. Are you getting tired? Yep. Had enough now, Dara. Have you? Yeah. Can I say something? Not a question. I just In the book it says the best way to the one way, way you can talk to Donna is to talk out loud to yourself about her. And I just uh, want to talk out loud to myself and, and say how grateful I am for, for Donna talking with us, because it's, it's hard work for her. And, and it's a, an exhibition of the same kind of strength and courage that's in the book. So I'm very grateful. Donna, thank you. It's all right, Peter Zalski. <laughs> you got both names now. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks. That's Donna Williams. Donna's book is called Nobody Nowhere. It's published by Doubleday. And the Dara, you heard her speaking with just at the, at the close of that conversation. There was also a reference earlier on, is Dara Rowland of Doubleday Publishers. And perhaps it's appropriate that Morningside offer our thanks to, to Dara and to Donna for this hour of radio. Peter Zosky with Donna Williams. That interview first aired on CBC Radio in 1992. If you'd like to hear more great material from the archives, tune in to Rewind. It airs Sunday nights at midnight on CBC Radio 1, and the rest of the week, Monday through Saturday at 2 p.m., and again at 5 a.m. on Sirius Radio 137. I'm Michael Enright, and I'll be back next week with a new episode of Rewind.